We've got to try that one more time. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let's pray. God, thank you for today. It was just the um, chance we have to be here together on this first Sunday of Lent to begin this journey. We'll go through the next seven weeks toward a Good Friday, the cross, and ultimately your resurrection. We ask that uh, today we'll start off in a great way to help focus our minds through this, um, through the path, through the way of the cross we're about to walk, um, that you would illumine our hearts of what the cross means for us today, and we would be ready to celebrate the resurrection. We ask all this in your son's name. Amen. 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 Well, as folks are coming in and uh, starting to grab their seats, I just want to remind anybody, everybody by way of announcement off the bat um, that two weeks from today, which is March 4th, we have a big celebration. Hopefully by now you've received um, your invitation to the uh, Kingdom Campaign Kickoff event. Uh, two weeks from today on March 4th at 5 p.m., in um, the 4-8 Center right down the road from here. And this is something that, uh, you know, it's, it's a big celebration. We're kicking out the campaign. It's not, uh, there's no solicitation that's gonna be given. But it's something we're really anticipating being an historic night in our parish's history as we kick off this once-in-a-generation type campaign. So it's, again, two weeks from today, 5 p.m. at the 4-8 Center. We hope everybody at the church is gonna be there. It'll be a really, really great night. Uh, but today, this morning, we're kicking off Lent in a six-week series through uh, this book by Tim Keller called Generous Justice. And actually, this uh, study is the brainchild of our uh, new mission, I, I guess I can still say your new, new-ish of the past year, Mission and Outreach uh, Director, Shereen David. If you haven't met Shereen yet, she is fantastic. She's revolutionized the church already, so make sure to come spend some time with her. But yeah, this study's really... Sure, yeah, of course. Uh, she is her brainchild. Um, and basically what we're going to be doing is we're going to be loosely following through the chapters of this book over the next six weeks. It's not going to be an exact parallel. We're going to invite folks to get this book um, called Generous Justice to read along with us and then pairing our reading with that book through Lent um, with different talks here in the rector's form. And they'll be more like augmentation, so not exact, we're not just gonna come in and you know, do a uh, you know, question and answer about the book, right? But uh, it'll augment your reading of the book as we journey together through Lent. And I wanted just to read quickly a passage from the introduction to the book to help um, understand a little bit more why and how this study is taking place. Um, in the introduction to his book, he's answering the question, why did I write this book? Tim Keller says this, you don't really realize that you really have a culture. You're blind to how many of your beliefs and practices are cultural. And I began to see how in so many ways that our cultural biases have been turned into moral principles. And then we use those things to judge others. What Tim Keller is describing there is actually an ancient Christian principle, first articulated uh, by St. Augustine, called the incurvatus in se, which is just a Latin phrase for the turning inward of ourselves. Through the process of being a part of the world, the world that we live in, we eventually turn inward on ourselves so we no longer see the ways in which our lives are not rightly ordered toward God. We come turn inward on ourselves and not turn, not oriented toward God. So one of the main reasons why we do a season like Lent, a season of penance and confession and fasting, is to help reverse that trend. And if we're curved inward on ourselves, then we develop disciplines, we develop different ways of living in the world that help reorient us to God. So this six-week journey has been largely to do that. We thought that a really great way to do that would be talking about this one theme, which as Keller says here in the introduction to this book, is one of the ways in which we've really been turned inward on ourselves. We no longer see the ways in which God has called us to live in this world. So with that said, I want to invite Serene up here, the great Serene David, to introduce our speaker for this morning, Christy Pike. Thanks, Nate. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here today. Um, like Nate said, we are, uh, we're not going to quiz you or give you an exam. But we highly encourage you um, getting the book and reading it along with us for the next six weeks. It's a really easy read. Um, I have some copies available here today for $12 each if you'd like to purchase one. Or you can get them on Amazon. It's, uh, it's on Kindle, and I, I think it's on iPad if you prefer that. Right, or you can get the Kindle version if you want to get it from Amazon. 
Um, and now it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Christy Pike. Uh, we've become fast friends here over the last several months. Uh, Christy is the Associate Program Manager for South Asia on behalf of the International Justice Mission, uh, which is based here in DC. And so we hand things over to Christy. She's going to kick us off from the series. Thanks, Christy. Let's give her a hand. Thank you. kickoff, your launch of the first chapter of Generous Justice um, by Tim Keller. This is an amazing book um, and it's really I mean, just his articulation of so many of the concepts that I feel like a lot of us have felt and I personally have felt my whole life. Um, it's so great when someone can put into words exactly what you're feeling. Um, but as Shereen said, my name is Christy Pike. I work for the International Justice Mission um, and I'm the Associate Program Manager for South Asia, which just essentially means India um, for us at IJM right now. And I thought we could do a little bit of introduction um, before we get started. A few people, I'd love to know your name and, and sort of what your professional title is, or I mean, how do you define yourself? Like, what would you, if you were introducing yourself, what would you say? Any volunteers? Uh, pick one. Pick one? Oh, wow. You me? I'm retired. That's my opinion. All right. Yeah, there are a lot of I used to be a, a dentist, and before that, I was a moral surgeon. And uh, I have been to India years ago. Answers a few questions. The first is, 
Why does God care about justice? And then, and the reason why we need to know why God cares about justice is because it then answers the question why we care about justice. The second is what even is justice? And then the third is how then do we do justice? So let's walk through the first question. And if, there, if, you, if there's any questions throughout the way, please you can raise your hand. Um, this can be uh, interactive during um, sort of the summary, but also we'll have time for a Q and A or some discussion at the end as well. Um, but either is totally fine. So why does God, God care about justice? Well, what we just established was it's essentially it's His name. <laughs> this is this is literally His title. He calls Himself a God of justice. In Isaiah, um, there's specifically a, a portion where it says, um, God, the Lord our God, is a God of justice. Uh, justice is in his character. In Psalm um, 146, does anyone have their Bible and want to read that out? I can as well. Yeah? All right. Let's just read out. It's just um, verse 7 through 9. And I want to, and I want to call out uh, this in particular. There are so many examples of when God talks about um, this being central to his being and to his character. I'll just give you once you have it. Yahweh, forever faithful, gives justice to those denied, gives food to the hungry, gives liberty to the prisoners. Yahweh restores sight to the blind. Yahweh straightens the bent. Yahweh protects the stranger. He keeps the orphan and widow. And it goes on and on. And it is, I mean, it is, it is all for, I mean, you just have to do a skim of the Old Testament, and it constantly talks about um, God being deeply, deeply concerned and focused um, on the marginalized and on the weak or on the poor. Um, that it is, it, is, it, is to the, it is very central to who he is. The second is, um, God is hopelessly relational. And I say that a little bit tongue-in-cheek, but, but the reality is, like, if you think about why are we here, what is the point? God and Trinity is actually in communion, fully satisfied in the communion in of himself. We actually, he doesn't need creation. There wasn't, we weren't fulfilling anything lacking in him. Why would he create creation? Why does he create humanity? And that question always puzzled me all the way growing up. Um, I did not understand what we were for. And until I kind of just realized that because God is relational, he's an incredibly social God, and that actually the whole act of loving, the whole act of, of, of being in communion with us is, it gives him great delight. And it is good, you know, in the creation story, it's every time he makes, and there's a new day and he creates, he says, it is good. Um, and, and so that... That process of loving his children um, and doting upon and delighting upon his creation in all of us is what gives him good, gives him um, so much delight. And when we thwart that, and when we are, and you'll find out later, one of the, the definitions of um, injustice is like a, is, an, is um, an unright relationship. And so when we are not in that relationship with God or with one another, that 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 offends him because he is so at his core relational and 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 when we prevent that in each other or in ourselves and we don't allow for right relationship um, that it, it distorts God's perfect uh, vision for relationship with us um, and Tim Miller also talks about this concept of. God being a just God is also what sets him apart from all other gods, um, or claimed gods. Uh, and and that there's a really interesting <clears throat> concept that is true, <clears throat> especially if you've studied other religions. So many ancient religions, the gods would work through the elite, right? They would always either, um, either they themselves were the elite, or they would a um, partnership or work through the Lord. I mean, you think about Homer, right? Or um, any of any of the ancient stories of gods coming to earth. Every once in a while, they'll like disguise themselves as the poor, but not because they were honoring the poor. They thought that that was, you know, but it was more, whenever they would do that, it would, you know, in the ancient tales, um, they would disguise themselves as the poor. It was almost to like spy on humanity, you know, or like trick them. And then they would like be revealed in all of their glory. 
Well, the really interesting thing about our God is that when he came, he actually came as, thank you, uh, he came as a Middle Eastern refugee who was homeless. Right? I mean, that's all, that, it, that is exactly, that, that's who he came as. And, and, there, and all throughout uh, Jesus' ministry, he talks about being homeless. He doesn't have a place to rest his head. He talks about being among the marginalized, and that's where he would head toward. And our God is so different in that way that instead of caring and wanting to be and to, to advertise his elitism, he, he, what he talks about so much more than anything else is, is the humility of, you know, our, our God, our creator, humbled himself to the point of the cross, humbled himself to the point of death. Um, that is very unique to our God. I mean, ultimately, we can't answer the, the, the question of why. Does God care about justice? Uh, I don't know. The, the answer is just he does. And he, he cares so deeply about people. Um, I, I think, if I had to guess, it's because why does he care about the poor? Why does he care about the marginalized? It's because nobody else does. And so, because he loves and he's so relational, it's, it's almost like he has to pay more attention because he knows that they don't have systems in place and don't have people in place who are, you know? Um, and, so, and so he says, you, you who've been neglected your whole life, you who've been bleeding for 15 years, you who've been blind and haven't been able to enter into society and have to sit on a rug outside of the city, you know, for, for all of your, of your existence, you, I'm going to see you because nobody else does. Um, because that's who he is as a God of justice, a God of love. So then, why do we care about justice, then? If that is true about our God, and we just kind of, at this point, just need to um, assume that that is true, because it's all throughout the text, what does that mean for us? Well, ultimately, it's because we are image bearers of God. Um, we laugh because he has a sense of humor. We inquire because he asks questions. Uh, we are a, a reflection and a mirror image of who God is, and so who, what God and who God cares about is very much what we care about, whether or not it's conscious or, or subconscious. That our yearning, that God's yearning and who he is, is built into who we are, and deep in our souls is going to be there as well. That we are going to yearn for the same things, because we are God's creation, and that is how he placed the image of himself in us since the beginning of time. And then, ultimately, uh, what Tim Keller talks about is that right doctrine, right understanding of who God is and what the scriptures are about not only includes, but leads us to an understanding of justice. Um, yes? Okay, So, my understanding has always been that God is a just God, right? Yes. God is perfect. God yes. is just. Because we cannot be perfect like God, mm -hmm. we cannot approach God, but because God loves us, we are able to enter his presence, right? Mm -hmm. So how does that relate to what you are saying? Like, I think we should care about justice because Christ, God is perfect, and because of that, because of his love, we are able to then be justified through him, mm -hmm. and we want everyone else to be justified. So how does that relate to what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah, so it's your question essentially. Um, I thought it was all about the salvation story. It, it, it is. It's definitely about the salvation story. And that, and that we will get there. The salvation story, though, is not just um, a right relationship between you and God. It's also a right relationship with each other as well, right? And so, so there, is, there is a justification between me and God, but there's also a restoring of our community and of the body of Christ. Um, if you look at Jesus' ministry, I mean, so, so why did God, why did Jesus come and die on the cross? What was that salvation for? And yes, it was for that moment on the cross in which all was justified. But there's also three years of ministry that he has before that moment that is an interesting sort of why. Why does he spend so much time um, not only walking around and healing and, and restoring and, and looking at the marginalized, but he also spends a lot of time stopping and making sure his disciples understand what's going on. And I think it's because he's doing, he's modeling. He's modeling what life 
what, what right life is like, like what we are actually supposed to, how we are supposed to live um, and what maybe righteousness actually is. I always grew up thinking righteousness was sort of like a transactional, transactional purity. Like, like I am pure, or like, or like God, I, I pray to God and God is gracious and then I get pure, you know? But it's kind of this like, it was just kind of in him and it was just kind of this thing. And, and, I, and I think I started to realize more that, that there was a little bit more to the story that actually maybe I'm not just supposed to, me, myself, have this, what, what Tim Keller says, um, is like private morality. That's not just about my own private morality, but it's about how I interact and how I engage with others as well. There's two things I want to say. Yes. One, that Jesus did ask one thing of us, which was to love each other. Mm -hmm. But a beautiful example of the importance of, of, of the, our relationships would be Ruth studying with Naomi. Mm -hmm. and that was a wonderful yeah. example of, yes, uh, uh, Ruth lost her husband, Naomi lost her two sons, but, but going back to Israel, becoming faithful again, uh, Ruth leaving Moab and and becoming a people of Israel and faithful to God again was redemptive and and, uh, and Naomi um, uh, led that and taught that so I think we see lots of examples of the importance of our relationships we yeah. want maybe more fellowship now uh, with you Christian right but that mattered very much right right yeah absolutely yeah I agree. And, and ultimately, you know, God is, God is our source of, of love, you know, I and mean, we only, we can only love one another if we are first loved, and if we first understand the amount that we are loved, and that is so important to be able to be in right relationship with God, but I think that, I think the ultimate point is just because it stop there, um, and that, and that in, in understanding how much we are loved, we understand, and all throughout scripture you see examples of people doing that, that we are transformed by God so that we can do a, a miraculous, uh, we are miraculously transformed people so that we can do the work of transformation in the world. Um, and that there's, there's a profound mystery that God uses us, this miraculously transformed group of people through his, through his work of salvation, um, for a purpose and for being his hands and feet on the world. This world is not yet completely restored. We're in an already but not yet period. That, that there is still so much brokenness and we are actually that solution. You know, his, his, his people who have been restored to right relationship with him um, are his hands and feet to do the rest of the work of, of redemption. That, that commissioning that Jesus does with his disciples is still continuing to today. Does that answer a little bit? Or do you have another follow-up? Yeah. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Thank you, Beth. Yeah, so um so this is this is kind of the core, right, of, of Tim Keller's argument is that there is that actually the work of justice is is not just an, a great additional side, but it is actually core to the gospel. Um, that, that what we are doing when, when we relate to God is partaking in his, in, in the work of redemption of the world that he is doing, that we are doing it with him, that that is part of the good news, that God is restoring the world and he's doing it through his people. Um, and then there's, there's a really interesting uh, point that he makes as well that I wanted to call out in that um, we're also not just talking about in avoiding injustice. Uh, and this is a little bit harder to swallow, but, but it's true, um, and you see it in the text that we're gonna read, uh, um, Job 31 in a second, um, because it's a really important, it highlights really well this point, is that it doesn't mean that I'm just not going around not exploiting people. Um, but it actually is an action. It is something that I have to do. I'm not, I don't just avoid um, exploitation. I actually have to do justice. Um, and that's part of the command that God gives us to the scriptures. Yes? It's kind of interesting because the four pillars of medical ethics are beneficence, non-malfeasance, justice, and autonomy. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, of all the, of the monotheistic religions, Christianity is the only one that's 100% volitional. 
Hmm. You, we are invited. Yeah. We are not compelled. We are not this or else. Uh -huh. We are invited. So that's the autonomy. Yeah. And then what you're just talking about is uh, that we don't just not do good. Right. Be, that's non malfeasance, but yeah. we would also um, must do good, which is right. beneficence. Mm -hmm. And then the whole thing is, is kind of centered on justice because by adhering to the first three, yeah. then we will allow justice to prevail. And, right. you know, all throughout the scripture it says, you know, for though, you know, each was according to their need by their means, yeah. um, you know, uh, just because of what is it, faithful that works is dead, and a dozen yep. other scriptures that we can say that really does make us do that. We are a peculiar people, we are called <coughs> apart and individually to continue the work of Jesus yep. on, on earth. So. Yeah, amen. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. The gospel doesn't just say peace is good. Jesus first is sermon. Right. Calls us to be peace is makers. Peacemakers. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we are supposed to bring forth that peace. Yeah, absolutely. There is there is a there is an action element to the gospel. There is an action element to, to our partaking in that gospel. Um, so I'll read really fast. So it's a lot of text, which is like PowerPoint uh, uh, 101 uh, to not do this. But um, I do want to just uh, read this out really fast for you because. Um, Tim Keller talk, talks about this exact verse in the in the Bible. I mean, in the um, in the first chapter um, from Job, and and I want to uh, read it. He says, um, "This is Job speaking. If I have denied the desires of the poor, um, sorry, yes. Oh, Job chapter 31, 13 through twenty-eight. Oh, what page does he reference it? Um, I don't know off the top of my head, but it's right there." At the before justice includes generosity. I think it's before that part of the first chapter. Um, so Job is speaking, if I have desired the desire, if I have denied the desires of the poor, or let the eyes of the widow grow weary, if I have kept my bread to myself, not sharing it with the fatherless, but from my youth I reared them as a father would, and from my birth I guided the widow, if I have seen anyone perishing or lacking for no clothing, or the needy without garments, and their hearts did not bless me for warming them with the fleece for my sheep. If I have raised my hand against the fatherless, knowing that I had influence in court, then let my arm fall from the shoulder, let it be broken off at the joint, for I dreaded destruction from God, and for fear of his splendor I could do, I could not do such things. If I have put my trust in gold and said to pure gold, you are my security, if I have rejoiced over my great wealth, the fortune my hands had gained, if I had regarded the sun in its radiance or the moon moving in splendor, so that my heart was secretly enticed and my hand offered them a kiss of homage, then these would be the sins to be judged, for I have been unfaithful to God on high. Yes? Okay, so my question then is, every single person in this room has done something yeah. like this. Okay? And, and so from a practical standpoint, we all walk by people who are homeless every day. Yeah. You see it all over the city. Yeah. yeah, there's all sorts of injustice yeah. everywhere in the world. Yeah. Um, how does this play out for like an individual who wants to really make a difference? And yes. and what do you do uh, in, 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 and still have any kind of bank account left over? Yeah, that is a really great question. Um, I mean, the crux of it is there is there is so much injustice in the world. Um, how can we each possibly, uh, you know, be completely right before God? Um, and is that, is that right? And, and and be able to do all of these things? Yeah. Um, no, I mean I was going to answer, and I've yeah. got I've got a thought related to that. Okay. Um. So. I, it's a really great question, and I'm going to get into that a little bit of just sort of what does that look like and how does that work. I mean, I also want us to be to be real in that we want to be smart about how we address injustice. Um, there's a lot of injustices that are systematic. There are a lot of injustices that um, maybe just giving somebody money on the street is not actually the most helpful thing to do, but rather working with an organization that systematically addresses why people are homeless to begin with. Um, or talks about you know policies that are good, or you know, and or maybe funding organizations that are doing that. It depends what example we're talking about, but 
yes, not, you're not always going to just give give away your all of your money to the first person that you see. There are, I would recommend that we go about this in a smart way um, and we address the, the underlying factors of injustice as well as just the ultimate and the immediate needs of our neighbors. I think we have to address both. Um, but I do want to get to some practical examples um, as well. Do you have a follow-up no, question then on that? that? that Yes. There are groups like uh, the Community Council for the Homeless, yeah. McKenna's Wagon, yes. uh, uh, Martha's Table, the House of Ruth, yep. the Salvation Army. They're yep. out there. They're doing this. And yep. many of the people in here have probably volunteered with yep. some of those one time. Yeah. Yep. So these are happening. Yeah. Yeah. Doing doing this work together is a whole lot more powerful than doing it alone. That's definitely for sure. Yes. I think to answer your question, I think sometimes it just comes down to how you lead your life every day. Mm -hmm. just a year or two ago, I was waiting for a bus, and yeah. there was a homeless man who was sitting on the curb, mm -hmm. and he couldn't stand up. Yeah. And there are other people standing around. I just went to, I gave him my hand, and I helped him stand up. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, he was dirty, he was awful, but it's like, how could I not? I think it's just simple things like that. You just yep. you treat That's someone as 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 a human, as yeah. as as one of God's creation. Yeah. Every and time you give people dignity, you are restoring them. I mean, that's 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 that. I mean, it's just if if each person just did that, then it accumulates, and it. I mean, to me, it's yeah. sort of that's it's that simple. Yeah. That's yeah. that's definitely a part of it. You know how you how you just relate to each other and to your neighbor, your physical neighbor, your global neighbor, your, you know, I mean, there is, there, that's definitely part of it. Do we treat each other with the dignity and respect of being an image bearer of God? Yeah. I, I think too, to, to get back to Dwayne's point, yep. is it goes back to prayer and scripture reading. Um, you, we all have resources. They're not unlimited. But we're also all called by God to do a particular thing. Mm -hmm. And it's prayer and scripture and reading the opportunities <coughs> God puts in front of you that tell you what your particular call is. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I can look at all the homeless in the city and you know, and I, like everybody else, I pass by them practically hourly, it feels like. Mm -hmm. um, but I also know, you know, A, Jesus came to save the world, that's not my job. <laughs> So I don't have to take all of it on, but I do have to pay attention to where God is leading me to do his work. So I have a very narrow job. Yeah. And my requirement is, is to listen to God and find out what my task in all of this yeah. is. And know that in his perfect yeah. wisdom, the rest of it, if people are attentive to him, everybody else will pick up their tasks and we'll get there. Yeah, yeah. I do. I do think we each have um, probably particular callings in that we lead, and that I, that the body of the, the diversity in the body is so beautiful that way, and that that we can also support others in what they are doing as well, right? And so I might not be the leading, you know, uh, researcher or policy on homelessness, but I certainly can support and you know and listen to to what is right and what is good about that. I can lend my voice and my vote and my advocacy. But by time, I might, you know, or what I'm doing with my profession might be um, doing anti-slavery work, you know, and then I might also, you know, so I might support other people in different ways. Um, someone else who's who, who's leading a movement, I can come alongside them, and then I will lead in this area. You know, I definitely think there's a lot, a lot there. Yes. Just to tag on to that, I mean, if we are called to be wise stewards as well, and it can be totally overwhelming and totally perplexing that, you know. To, you know, get a hundred dollars worth of five dollar bills when you walk down the streets of uh, uh, Manhattan or DC or something. But there are resources. I mean, like uh, Charity Navigator exists. Okay, so if, you're, if you if you if you pray about something and you think you should give to this cause, then do your due diligence and look on it and see what percentage of the funding actually goes to the people who need it and things like that. And there are ways that can, we can do it. So we need to combine like the resources that God has given us, even if it is evil internet that Ed told us not to use that <laughs> uh, or something like that. But we need to do that and we need to pray about it and let the spirit 
their vetoes and then make the decision. And, and if enough of us do that, yeah. each of us, just as you said, we'll all have, and just as you said, that we'll all have our own little channel yeah. and all together there will be a huge interstate of good. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. So one of the, all three of those things are great uh, pragmatic suggestions and, and I appreciate hearing those. Um, another thought that I had after in, in listening here was, was one way to do it, I think, is to uh, spread the word of God. Because when the word of God is spread, what happens? People change. How do they change? People change from the inside. Because then they're not motivated uh, uh, and, and, and driven by um, all of the cultural and other influences that are placed on people that, that uh, cause people to act and react in all sorts of situations. And so in that way, as more people become um, uh, understanding of the Christian faith and understanding of the importance of Christ and what Christ has done for everybody, that then spreads in the culture. And when it spreads in the culture, it infects some of the people who have some of the systemic problems that we're seeing, the homelessness or, the, or alcoholism or, or drug addiction or, or you know, whatever, because the person has changed from the inside. So that's how I'm thinking about this stuff. Yeah, I think one of the things that I love about Tim Keller's intro is he is he he makes a really clear point that it's it's both that we can't die, you know divorce um, like or, you know good theology and love for scripture and, and God from uh, justice because it doesn't it doesn't actually make sense because actually white doctrine leads leads to justice and that that yes like we all are here because we love Jesus. And we want others to as well. But if we are, are talking to someone and we are trying to spread the love of God, but are just completely ignoring their needs and allowing it just to exist, then it's inauthentic, you know, preaching of, of that gospel, right? And so, so that both and is definitely there. But I think you get to people by, you get, to, you, you get God to people, you get Jesus to people by um, helping them with some of their needs. Yeah. In other words, you know, if somebody's hungry, you buy them lunch. If you know those types of things, and that's how you can get it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, if God, if God is a God of, of justice and a God of love, then by loving people and doing justice, you are you are allowing them to experience God as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, I was given I was given an, a sign to keep moving. So we'll we'll try to run through some more um, examples. But I do want to give you just sort of what this. I, I thought and prayed a lot about what this looks like um, for me and for us at IJM. So, um, a few practical notes. This is when Tim Keller gets a little bit dirty. Um, but what is justice? He talk, He goes through sort of three concepts. Um, and uh, I'm sorry if I completely butchered the pronunciation. Um, so in Micah 8, do justice and love mercy. We all know that passage. Um, and... And he talks, and I love that he addresses how sometimes it feels like those two, the two things are totally separate. But actually, if you look at the, the original words, mishpat and chesed, mishpat is the action of what you are doing, the action of, of doing justice, and the chesed is, is God's compassion. And so really, the way you want to look at that verse is essentially do mishpat out of chesed. You, you do these acts of, of, of uh, justice because you are motivated by mercy, because you have experienced God's mercy. And so this is an outpour and an overflow of our own understanding of grace and mercy and compassion, the compassion that God had on us and the compassion that God had on others. And that is an outflow. And doing justice is an outflow of that. Um, and then another interesting point that he makes is that is this word mishpat, which which is is the word for justice um, often um, when it's translated into English, and it's actually giving people what they are due, giving people their rights. It's used in relation, for example, when we talk about priests who are due tithe, you know, the, the, of, of the, the tithing that that is their right. It is what they are due, um, and so that is one version of of this word. Another is. The poor who are due care and protection. So it's not. So he, he says it's not just charity. It's not just okay. I'm gonna you know 
like a sandwich on the side over here. It's like actually what this person is due that we are that people are due care and protection and that so when we are fulfilling it, it's not like, oh I'm so great because I'm being so nice to this person. It's like, no, this person actually was this is what they were due. Um, and we are just fulfilling that. Yes. I love this. So right is a huge buzzword in our country compared to other cultures, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. And um, it comes with a lot of baggage and a lot of kind of what we think is a right. And, and I'm curious yeah. how um, that differs by culture and how other cultures might interpret that and how like we as Americans bring our own special spin on that. Yeah, yeah, that is a that is a great question. Um, there are obviously legal rights um, that you have. You also have fundamental human rights um, that we talk often about that can be debatable um, a lot. This this is in con in context of the Old Testament. Um, uh, so given like the Mosaic Law, what people were do and what got you know sort of the system that, that God set up. I would say from a throughout Scripture, if we're, if we're looking about it, what what God thinks that people are do. Um, a really basic sort of fundamental is that care and protection um, that's talked about here of, of what and, and being um, uh, being treated uh, be with with justice and, and equity uh, would be sort of maybe a, a foundational. But yeah, I mean it's a it's a really good point. Um, other cultures also have a lot of. I mean, at least in India as well, there's a lot of debates on around. What, what is someone's right? Housing, for example, is a big debate. Is that a fundamental right for people? Yes. So, you know, to your point about rights, um, I was always, you know, I was brought up on the notion that which our society has not lost, that, that rights have, of course, only been responsible. And so that's what I think is we are lacking today. We always talk about people's rights, but we don't talk about their responsibilities. I had a quick question on, on Mishpah. Is that a, like correlated to the, you hear the word mitzvah, like doing a good deed? Is that, they seem like, uh, well, I, don't, I don't know if they're Maybe questions are answered. I don't know. Oh. Yeah, they're related, but it's not the same I was just curious. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. That's an interesting question. Um, and then there's the last uh, concept that's brought up often, um, and it's this word uh, tezdah, which is what is used when we talk about righteousness. And this is what we talked a little bit earlier um, when we were talking about that private morality. That actually, you know, this this word and this understanding of righteousness, we always, you know, we kind of have this concept of like, okay, I, like I want to just be good in of my in of myself, but actually it's treating all relationships with equity. So our sister over here who was talking about the way in which we just approach people as well, you know, how we interact and how we um, are kind or you know are, are just in the in a, just our day-to-day -day interactions um, also plays into uh, this idea of righteousness. Um, so what what does that actually do? How do we, how do we actually do it? Um, I am not going to be able to give you a comprehensive list. Uh, there, there is so much. There is so much to do. Um, trust me, I'm, I'm someone who, like this. This is my whole orientation of life. So it's not just IJM. I see it in everything. I wish I could do. I wish I could have nine lives and and do it all. Um, but I'm going to give you a few principles of, of what this in my own work and when I see my colleagues in India. Um, what's inspired and motivated me. Um, one of them would be to remember the one. Um, and, and I think, yes, there, there's so much systematic injustice, but to also to remember that there's a person behind it and to look people in the eye and to walk alongside people, that transforms you when you see it face to face. And I want to introduce you to Surya, and I'm going to just tell you what we mean, what I mean by this, really quickly. Surya was an 11-year-old boy in Tamil Nadu in the south of India, um, and he came from a really, really poor family. And one day, a man shows up and offers um, essentially $12 to his family and says, "I'm going to get this little boy a better job in the state of Maharashtra, which is um, on the other side of the country." 
So jumping at that chance, it felt like a really good opportunity. Um, they took the money and they sent Surya and his cousin Vijay all the way to this uh, to Mumbai um, across the country. Turns out that that promise for a job, like so many of our victims that we see, it was a total bold-faced lie. He got sold into slavery and ended up working, um, making basically candy, um, like those little candies that they sell on the side of the road in like a little shop. He had to work 16 hours of a day, and any time he would work too slow, he was beaten. Any time he wanted to stop working, he was beaten. Any time he wanted to take a break, he was beaten. Any time he wanted to go home, he was beaten. And this happened for five years. And the owner continued to, to impress upon him and to tell him and Vijay, um, essentially, this, you are never leaving. This is your new life. Vijay, his cousin, um, finally got up enough courage to escape. And, and he figured out a way and escaped from, from that place. Surya was still there. And the owner beat Surya and then called Surya's parents and said, if you don't return Vijay, I'm going to kill your son. Surya's parents were so desperate. They had no idea where their son was. They had no idea what to do. They themselves were from a really, really poor village. They just went to authorities. Thankfully, those authorities had a relationship with us. They came to us and asked us um, for, asked for help. We had no idea where Surya was. I w it's, like, it's like searching for a needle in a haystack. You know how big, how many millions and millions of people in one city alone. Um, and so we started, we have, a, we have an office in Mumbai as well. And together for five months, we started, we looked and we searched and we could not find Surya. And I think back to this passage in Luke and I love the story and I remember praying so intensely to find this boy. Um, because it reminds me of when Jesus uh, tells a parable of the shepherd who leaves the 99 to go searching for the one. And, and for me, it's such an important principle because, because I, we talk in millions. You know, when you're talking about slavery, you're talking in millions, 150 billion, you know, generated illegal profits per year. And it's so easy to get caught up in that. And so for me to just remember, we are looking for Surya. We're looking for him for five months. And after five months, miraculously, because we have a miraculous God who loves us, who's in this work with us, and it's not us doing it on our own strength, we found him. And we were able to take him from this place of total darkness where he was beaten regularly anytime he wanted anything. We were able to send him home and restore him with his family. He's now 16 years old. He's learning a trade, he's learning carpentry, and, and, he's, and he's learning what it means to be a kid again, um, to, to have hopes and dreams, to choose what he wants to do. That, for me, is a principle that I carry with me on how you do justice. You remember who it is that you're doing it for. You remember the one. Um, and then, I'll tell one other story and then we'll, I think we'll move on. Um, I, I love the concept, anytime we talk about the body of Christ, anytime we talk about our brothers and sisters around the world, to remember that this is our family. What would you do for your family? And this is a really scary topic because it's because then you get into the to what extent, right? Are we actually able to like, how much are we actually able to do for, for all of our, our family? But um, in that Job passage where, let me just go back to that really fast, where he talks about, I, I have denied the desires of the poor. He doesn't talk about if I had not denied food and water for the poor. That there's a sense of this is actually a desire, um, that we are filling the desires. We aren't just filling basic, basic needs, but actually also like how, you know, t so that, so that those on the marginalized can, can delight, um, and this is my sister Priyanka, and I'll end up with this story. And this is what I love about it. She was rescued from a brothel um, in Kolkata. And, and in, that, in that process of being in an after care home, um, we started asking her what she wanted to do, who she wanted to be. And she had no opportunity, she has no family. And there was a, a woman who was volunteering there and teaching all of the kids um, field hockey. And she, st and she noticed them from the side and she said, what are they doing? I want to learn that. And she started taking classes and doing field hockey. And she started realizing that she loved 
field hockey. And, and through these, this woman who's volunteering, she took special notice of her and started realizing that Priyanki was so good and so passionate about this that she started giving her extra lessons on the side and bringing out this passion in her. And just a few months ago, Priyanka um, won the state championships in West Bengal for field hockey, uh, which is so awesome because for me, it, it's a reminder of it's not just about giving people basic living, but igniting desires for them to thrive. For us, it's not about just rescuing from them, them from slavery. It's, it's allowing humans to experience what freedom is all about and it's to be able to choose and to thrive and to, to, to have that independence of, of knowing what it is to have an accomplishment that you're working for. What, that's, what, that's what does it for us, right? To have a passion, to be able to be proud of what you've done, to be able to live and to thrive, and that is what we're fighting for. Um, so these are just a few examples of what we do. Uh, and I think I'm totally out of time. So I'm so sorry. You all had such great questions. And uh, I can ask, I can stay around after as well. <laughs> Thank you, Christine. Um, yeah, so she's going to hang out here for a little while if anyone has any questions. Um, or if you have questions to ask, I will pass the mic around if you want to go around. Yeah, so we're here. Hope you come back next Sunday for part two, six week series. So come back. So, um, yeah, and get the book. If you want a book, it's 12 o'clock. Thank you.